Hello, and welcome to the Talking Precision Medicine podcast. In this series, we sit down with experts on the application of AI and big data analytics in the drug discovery space. Our guests are innovators, business decision makers, and thought leaders at the intersection of data and therapeutics. We discuss the promise, practice, challenges, and myths of AI in precision medicine. This show is brought to you by Genialis, and Raphael, its CEO, is your host. Genialis is focused on data integration and predictive modeling of disease biology to help accelerate the discovery and de-risk the development of novel therapeutics. Hi-Fi Bio is among the most exciting young biotechs out there. They've built a discovery engine called Drug Intelligent Science, encompassing single cell, immune profiling, and machine learning. DIS enables rapid and precise identification of targets, therapeutically active antibodies, and patient stratifying biomarkers. Listen in as Hi-Fi Bio's CEO, Liang Schweitzer, joins Genialis's Raphael Rosengarten to discuss their science, pipeline, and the race to develop a potentially life-saving COVID therapy. It's my pleasure today to be joined by Liang Schweitzer. Liang is the CEO of Hi-Fi Biotherapeutics. Um, I've known about Hi-Fi Bio for a number of years now, but I'm really going to let Liang tell their story. She does it better than me. So welcome, Liang, and uh, let's jump right in. Tell us about Hi-Fi. Thank you, Raphael. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, Hi-Fi Bio is an emerging multinational company uh, where we're mobilizing the human immune system to combat diseases. The vision we set out to have is try to pioneer curative immune therapy for each and every patient. So, so to achieve that, um, what we um, set out to drive our mission is to unlock the curative power of the immune system um, by building a sustainable pipeline of biotherapeutics. That sounds uh, ambitious, both kind of precision medicine and personalized medicine. What, what makes you unique? What gives you kind of an insight into how to unlock this curative potential? Um, so um, one of the things uh, when we started Hi-Fi Bio is trying to figure out, you know, how do we modulate immune systems using an approach that nobody else have that kind of uh, uh, approach yet, or, you know, at the frontier of the technology angle. So we, our scientific co-founders, Put together their advanced technology from their academic labs into this company that is centered around single cell technology platforms. When I started joining HiFi as a co-founder, CEO, and CSO, uh, one of the ways, um, because of my extensive past uh, drug discovery and development background, I started to think about how do we best apply the single cell into the immune modulation Angle. So in addition to the initial thoughts from the co-founders putting single cell to look at single B cell cloning and screening for secreted antibodies from each individual B cells to identify antibody therapy for antigen and evolved to today where we use single cell analysis to looking for uh, also biomarkers for patient stratification when we identify the antibody. Then also in turn, when we get patient samples to analyze for biomarkers, it reveals some deep biology where we can start to think about what are the targets that related to the disease we can effectively target it. So, so now we are applying this power of cutting edge single cell technology and try to changing the paradigm, how we do drug discovery and development by identify relative targets, um, rapidly uh, you know, discover high quality antibody therapies and position to the patients that could be predicted through our single cell effort, uh, come up with predictive biomarkers to position this high quality antibody therapy to the right patient population. Wow. So, so let me see if I can wrap my head around this. So your system allows you to uh, essentially screen for antibodies that have a therapeutic impact to identify potentially biomarkers for those, also to identify targets based on the, the disease biology you're assaying, and to essentially come up with a, you know, essentially a therapeutic asset in your pipeline that already has the, the target, the biomarker, 
presumably the cell tech. How does the platform work exactly? Do you start with sort of a, dis a phage display library? Like what do you feed into this? So the platform core basis is microfluid droplet-based system. So we have a system that can rapidly generate microfluidic droplet in a speed 5,000 to 10,000 mm -hmm. droplets per second. Imagine that droplet is like a experimental micro titer plate well. So in that well or in that droplet, you can put in a cell with reagent. So, so for anybody's identification efforts, we put in a single B cell in that droplet together with antigen. That antigen could be a soluble form or could be a form of expressing in a native conformation on another cell type. For example, if we're looking at GPCR, you can express the seven transmembrane protein in a native conformation with CHO or 293 cells. So in sure. the droplet where you have a B cell secreting anybody binds to the antigen, either soluble form or expressed on another cell surface, we use fluorescence to tracking. So if mm -hmm. one is green fluorescent, one is red fluorescent, when they coexist inside, right. we know they are going to generate, you know, the binding event. Our technology can sort that droplet out. So you can discard all those B cells secreting anybody, it doesn't bind them to your energy. Mm -hmm. But sorting out that population that have the anybody binds to that specific energy then we can apply single cell sequencing, identify the heavy chain light chain using our unique DNA barcoding technology. So we can do a native pairing of the heavy chain light chain. So this unique angle, you know, um, the droplet based, mm -hmm. you can generate the experimental assay in that droplet, mm -hmm. first step. Second, you can sort out based on the phenotype Third, you can get to the genotype associated with that phenotype. So, so it's a very powerful approach. Just imagine you don't putting B cells in that droplet. You're putting mm -hmm. a T cell. You can look at a specific TCR, you know, mm -hmm. bone stimulation with right. our drugs and looking at what are the biomarker changes. That's the process we do for biomarker discovery. Got it. I, I could imagine you could really assay virtually any cell type in the immune compartment you wanted to. Are these cell culture or engineered cells you're putting in, or can you also do patient cells? We do patient cells. And, mm -hmm. and then you just made a comment about looking at immune cells. Yes. All the immune cells, they're suspension cells, so it's very easy to encapsulate it in a droplet. But we have also done work with tumor cells epithelial cells, stroma cells with fibroblasts, as long as you can dissociate them to the individual cells. So we published a paper in Nature Genetics in 2019 talking about our single cell RNA sick and single cell chip sick with tumor cells and stroma cells. You know, based on what our past experience, any cell types you want to look at as long as they can be dissociated at the single cell level we can right. use our technology yeah, to analyze. Very cool. So, you know, if you're, if you're trying to activate curative uh, power of the immune system, today it seems like all therapeutics are, are immunology, but what are the therapeutic areas you're focused on? So um, when we started uh, the company, one of the things I thought about is I have to build the therapeutic pipeline based on what we know most. And we cannot, knowing you know, every biology aspect, we should build a unique angle. So we choose immune modulation is because you know, not only immuno-oncology has been attracted so much attention. Personally, I, I was fortunate enough during that time at BMS involving Uvoy Optivo's uh, work, development work, but also you know, was a co-inventor for some of the later immunomodulation therapy. So, so that's where I felt being exposed to so many years have a good understanding. But also recent literature find out, you know, if you have immune dysregulation, it could be also plays a lot of role in other diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, neurodegenerative defects. Immune modulation, if we understood in a very deep level, you could be applied to multiple disease area. Mm -hmm. Including recently, right, we just 
joined force to combat COVID-19. And although it's not directly modulate the immune system, we're directly you know, preventing the virus from infecting the host cells by neutralizing anybody. But it was you know, identified from convalescent patient B cells. So due to our understanding how to deal with those B cells uh, with human samples, we could rapidly identify anybody from the technology, you know, we an in-house discovery capability that we have. Got it. So, so these are neutralizing antibodies? Yes. I'd like to do a, a quick dive into your COVID work since this is so recent and, and frankly rapid. So let's, let's pause on discussing the pipeline uh, as a whole, because I do want to come back to that uh, and to sort of your, your main therapeutic thrust. Tell us about your, your sort of pivot into, into addressing COVID antibodies. How did you mobilize the team? What, what did that look like for the rest of your work? As I mentioned at the beginning, we're a multinational team, although we're a startup. <laughs> so uh, that's one of the unique thing about hi fi Bio. I'll be happy to chat a bit more. Um, we have team in China, in US, as well as Europe and Paris. So uh, when the pandemic hits in China, that's where it initially, mm -hmm. you know, we read about it through the news and our China team got infected after the Chinese mm -hmm. New Year, they cannot go back to work. And I start looking to the situation, start reading literature about this virus, uh, mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2. And one of the things I realized through literature deep dive is it's not going to be a local problem. Mm -hmm. The you know, infection, the spreading of the virus is so rapid. And with today's global traveling environment, sooner or later, we will be a global situation. And that was at, towards end of February. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, at that time, I did not want it to distract the whole team from doing any of the work they set out to do for internal pipeline. At that time, we had 10 programs moving mm -hmm. forward rapidly. So I started at, you know, myself moonlighting, start evening and weekend, start calling hospitals, calling academic institution to see who wants to join force can, you know, help us identify patient sources and looking for convalescent, how our technology might be helping. With that in mind, you know, we identified um, collaborators to work on across the world and uh, then I started assigning one project leader who actually, you know, um, being project needing um, team rather than a technology team because everybody needing the project is always busy, already busy. I did not want to, you know, take them from their daily project. So basically this one leader from the technology team volunteered to lead chaperone the project together with me. So we mm -hmm. actually um, drive this to close to IND um, filing. So all those work, suffice to say, is volunteering work from our people, mm -hmm. not taking any objectives from their or already fully noted daily schedule. Um, wow. so, so we we mobilized people's passion, if you will. And of course, you know, we, we also got our support of our board and investors um, mm -hmm. willing to, to put in financial means into it to complete the preclinical work where we use mm -hmm. COs to do, you know, GLP tops, manufacturing, as well mm -hmm. as we engage clinical CRO for phase one work. So, it. so yeah, it's a combination with internal volunteering work with external CRO. So, so we're recording this in mid-February, 2021. And, and you first said, you said your China team started, got infected or you started moonlighting late February, 2020. So it hasn't even been a full year. And, right. And you already have a drug, you said in phase one trials? Yes. So that was unprecedented speed. By the time we start thinking about it, working on it. So February, we haven't really started working on it. We're just thinking about reaching out to collaborators. So I, I was, you know, online all the time, reach out to all the network I could have think of. And to August 25th, we filed IND. In my career, we never have done the speed to file uh, IND from starting the conceptual of a project mm -hmm. to, to filing within six months. You know, I attribute that towards the 
international scientific society's contribution because everybody published their paper right online, if you mm -hmm. recall you know, at that time. Whoever done the work, it's already you know, getting to buy archive or some mm -hmm. other public you know, sources so we can read what's going on in real time almost, you know, mm -hmm. before the paper were published. And we can also leverage resources such as we have collaborators start having the virus, mm -hmm. live virus mm -hmm. assay and, you know, infected um, CINO models where right. we don't have to, you know, build in-house. So, so it's really a collaborative work and where we could also leverage some of the open mindset of FDA where right. we actually could submit, for example, our initial trials, you know, is getting to a rapid manufacturing mode um, where mm -hmm. FDA accept it and uh, so so from that perspective um i think everybody in the society pitched in enabled that and, mm -hmm. and i think you know it will happen again unless there's another emergency and you know, hopefully we won't face that again <laughs> yeah I've, I've given interviews where i said that you know one of my hopes coming out of COVID is that you know, we've really over indexed on this collaboration and pre competitive sharing. And I hope we, we keep some of that, right? I hope we don't swing yeah. all the way back to, you know, our own little tribes and, and high walls and, and silos afterwards. I, I definitely think coming out of it, we will have some positive changes. I think people are a bit more willing to, you know, share their results. And we definitely benefit from people publish their results online. Hopefully that will continue. Probably it wouldn't be as open as what we have experienced, but okay. it will be a you know, step towards the right direction. So just to kind of tie off the, the um, piece about your COVID work, what does the clinical roadmap ahead look like? Do you have a partner to help with the bigger trials, with distribution? Do you anticipate an emergency yeah. use approval? This is an excellent question. Um, initially, we were thinking about just as a humanitarian effort, then we can hand over to a partner who has more infectious disease expertise as well as commercial capability. And uh, the interesting part is when we started IND filing in August, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. the whole pandemic stress is net, you know, night. And uh, so there are not many partners willing to chaperone this into phase one with us. And we did not want to have this drug sitting there. So we actually convinced, um, you know, our key stakeholders supporting us to bring it to phase one. So um, currently we've complete phase one dosing and our phase one have been designed into a 180 day follow up because we engineered this, anybody have an extended half life. That's one of the unique features. Um, we wanted to be able to bring this drug to patients, not have to repeat it getting injections, um, but rather, you know, get up to a year protection based on the half life we design. In, you know, reality, why all those patients have been dosed, we're following them in 180 days after dosing. In the meantime, mm -hmm. we did start kickoff of phase two, three work because um, FDA announced us to go ahead with phase two, three without getting every cohort um, 180 day data. So, so from that perspective, we've been reaching out to uh, farmers trying to you know, establish a partnership. We are in some conversation right now and uh, hopefully something will come out of it because as you can imagine, as a small biotech, our resources is limited, our expertise are limited and we definitely think we have a differentiating uh, molecule, not only in terms of half-life mm -hmm. I just mentioned, but mm -hmm. also in terms of coverage. So far now, our anybody based on the assay we have, reagent we can access, we have confidence we will, you know, um, be effective towards the mutant. We, we tested more than 16 mutants, including mutations involving non-land mutations, South African mutation. Oh, wow. So far, we demonstrate the binding. As well as um, the other aspect we differentiate ourselves is we engineered the antibody in a way that we have a reduced FC gamma receptor binding that minimizes the ADE antibody dependent enhancement. 
which it could be a potential liability. Um, right. So we address that angle as well. So, so we think we have differentiated anybody which can help patients in a way mm -hmm. that others cannot yet. And so, so we are very excited to hopefully finding a partner sooner rather than later yeah. to move forward. Just my last thought on COVID with regards to drugs is there's been so much focus and so much noise um, about the vaccines for obvious reasons, right? You know, that's sort of the first line of defense. But, you know, if you think about the future of COVID, especially as it, you know, in comparison to other similar, you know, infectious diseases, even like the flu, plenty of people still get sick and plenty of people still die. And having, you know, treatments is going to be a huge and critical component to getting life back to normal. Um, yes. So I, I really applaud this effort. Thank you. So, so I also, um, you know, one of the things that I have been reading and following literature is even those patients who can recover from COVID infection, you know, because of their own immune system, because it takes so long to recover, mm -hmm. often there are secondary complications associate with them even after they recover. So the idea of having this neutralizing antibody blocking the virus from further in infecting the mm -hmm. host cells, it will be really long-term effect benefit for people, even they can recover themselves. That's one of the things I, I definitely wanted to advocate for people who tested positive just to get treatment right away. Don't wait yeah. until it has to be progressed to the severe level. That, that, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, and as, as a point of reference to listeners who maybe haven't been following the saga, this is a therapy in the same, we'll say, umbrella grouping as, as the infamous Regeneron or, or, you know, Lilly antibodies. But, you know, those were the really early players. And, and as Liang has described, um, the HiFi uh, COVID antibodies have a lot of advantages, it sounds. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's a nice summary. <laughs> So, so if it, if it weren't for, for COVID this year, you know, wh wh what's the rest of your pipeline about? You know, we'd started talking yeah. about therapeutic areas where, you know, the immune system is important. And, you know, I think the short answer is everywhere, but you know, the longer answer is wh what, what's the rest of your pipeline up to these days? So, so as I mentioned to you, you know, I come from an oncology background, not only mm -hmm. in BMS, I was also head of Asia Cancer Research for Sanofi. So immuno-oncology is an area I'm passionate about. So we have two um, assets are entering clinical trials this year, and uh, mm -hmm. they are agonists. So one is OX40, one is TNFR2. Mm -hmm. We actually, um, went into this kind of approaches with a unique differentiation for clinical trial design. Uh, you know, in addition to the molecule we designed would be differentiated, um, especially OX40 from previous generation. Mm -hmm. But one of the things giving us the confidence to enter the clinical trials is through our single cell biomarker analysis. So as we know, you know, checkpoint inhibitors has achieved success in clinical setting and help many patients, agonists uh, have been encountered challenges and you know, many companies tried clinical trials. Uh, the results is not you know, as uh, hoped for. And although you know, uh, there are some hints of success, for example, Oxbody, you do see some hints um, like 5% responses in certain trials, but it did not hit you know, the naval PD-1 inhibitors, you know, the checkpoint mm -hmm. inhibitors that reach. So one of the things we have thought about, and that's where our single cell technology applies is to figure out why that is the situation. One of the simple analysis we did for our first naval is looking at in different tumor environments, whether this anybody is ex Oh, the targets is expressed in the relevant cell types, whether mm -hmm. our anybody get to the tumor micro environment can modulate those cell types as, you know, in vitro mm -hmm. or preclinical model suggested. And it's very interesting for us to see when you use single cell to analyze those tumor, primary tumor samples. And mm -hmm. the biology it indicates actually is much more complex than the bulk analysis 
Um, sure. For example, you know, we, we have a preview here for TNFR2, you know, you, you hear not about TRAC biology and uh, we, we find exhausted CD8 cells also express TNFR2 from our single cell analysis. And those are the cells actually can be activated upon our drug treatment. And why TREC people worry about the high level expression with our antibody drugs, actually we can see, you know, there's a differences of activation versus TREC depletion. So, so there's some intricate disease related mm -hmm. biology, you single cell, you can tease that out. And there yeah. are certain tumors enriched in T factor cells, there's certain tumors is driven more by the TRAC effects. So you mm -hmm. actually can figure out the right setting, um, mechanistic setting to position your drugs into it. Amazing. And so I, I presume this also gives you a sense of, you know, maybe what diseases to go after and Exactly. And do you do you envision then your clinical strategy um, requiring either a companion or or complementary diagnostic a biomarker to go with the drugs, or or do yeah. you have a sense the efficacy will be high enough that you won't need that? We we actually um, think you know the critical pieces is to have a biomarker approach, you know mm -hmm. whether that has to be a novel companion diagnostic or it could be you know just provide some insight could using a already existing companion diagnostic right. to enrich your patient population that uh, we are mm -hmm. still exploring. But one thing we actually um, start seeing more and more clearly is a lot of design early on is from all comers pushing for MTD, for agonist setting, that's mm -hmm. not going to work very well. So, so we are looking at specific indications where we think you will be having enriched response, as mm -hmm. well as we are looking for optimal biological doses, not pushing for the maximum tolerant dose. Right. I think, and, and dosing scheduling plays an important role as well. So we advocate design uh, agonist trials. It has to be a novel innovative approach, not mm -hmm. following the existing approach for checkpoint inhibitors, where I see some of the other previous earlier trials, you know, have followed that path and encountered challenges. No, it, it's occurred to me just, you know, working on a number of immune oncology projects that even the way that you would approach PKPD modeling has to be quite different for, yeah. you know, for modulating the immune system and especially as you describe immune agonism. Yes, totally agree with that. Yeah looking at PD very closely and uh, also, you know, thinking about, you know, how do we select the right doses based on our PKPD readouts and one of the other elements incorporated into the design of our clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does your single cell platform in some ways restrict which diseases you can look at because of tissue requirements or, or how do you, you know, so thinking ahead to where you're actually taking patient samples, you know, so what are the, so, the requirements there? So, so far we haven't um, encountered restriction of the types, but the restriction more um, coming from, can we get fresh sample or mm -hmm. can we get, you know, frozen sample? If we haven't explored like paraffin invaded samples, that would right. be another level and we explored said whether we can extract DNA from those samples using mm -hmm. some technology, but we haven't spent time and resources there yet. So, yeah. so we prefer fresh sample as you right. can imagine. So when we do single cell clinical trials, we were thinking about, you know, collaborating with top academic or oh, clinical institutions mm -hmm. in Boston area where our US site is. So, right. so you get the fresh sample right away. So that's one of the things yeah. we prefer. But you, you can imagine though, if you've developed a biomarker based on you know, fresh samples as your training set where you, you, the model learns, you could extrapolate, let's say at the end of the day, your biomarkers cell specific expression of three or four markers, right? You, right. Could, you could then extrapolate that to a, a fixed or frozen tissue right. and, and even contemplate using one of the spatial profiling systems like a nanostring geomix or something 
Exactly. You, you basically spoke my words. <laughs> That's exactly what we plan to do. And uh, we, we discussed earlier about the philosophy of companion diagnostics. If, mm -hmm. you know, there's already existing platforms. And right now, what we do, we wanted to, you know, design phase 1B centered around our biomarker strategy using single cell. So we were obtain a lot of information data. And uh, I think, you know, with the machine learning algorithm, that's an area you are very familiar with and expert mm -hmm. at. We wanted to come up with certain, you know, signatures that can be measured through a classical approach. That would be mm -hmm. ideal. So um, in order to apply this to our current um, upcoming clinical trials for Oxford and TNFR2, we actually did a pre-training set PD-1 single cell data and to see whether we can build an algorithm predict a marker, which we did and which we know that marker can be measured in a classical mm -hmm. manner. And uh, then we used that marker went into the trial data, the actual trial data that is published right. and to see whether it can bring better outcome and it did. And we actually filed IP as well as the manuscript best way mm -hmm. Hopefully it come up. Yeah, I, I think the machine learning piece feels a bit scary to some folks. And also there's a lot of uncertainty around how the FDA will treat machine learning as it pertains to software as a medical device, only because they haven't formulated a full guidance on it yet. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the machine learning toolkit is really helpful when you have these big piles of say single cell data and how to yeah. abstract that to a much simpler biomarker that you can measure in a more class. If you can call spatial profile in classical, I mean, it's cutting edge in itself, but, but it's, it's counting, right? So you can get to that. The key there, you know, is the FDA is just going to want to see a few things. One is independence of your training and validation data set. So they want to see that you've shown this works. And at the end of the day, it's about having clinical outcomes that relate to the marker. You know, they're not going to penalize you for having arrived through some cutting edge science, right? No, no, we actually um, consulted regulatory biomarker expert on that front. Mm -hmm. As long as we do exploratory, like using mm -hmm. our single cell analysis, mm -hmm. that is totally fine. It's mm -hmm. when you actually zooming into your conclusion as you, you just suggested, right, mm -hmm. where you can demonstrate. Of course, if we wanted to promote using single cell as part of the companion diagnostic, that will take a much longer <laughs> way. Yeah, of course. But right now we hope we don't have to get there, but you never know, right? Maybe in the future, there will be much more effective ways to getting single cell results. Yeah. Maybe that would be the best way to predict biomarker. And I'm not through yeah. that possibility, yeah. Sure. I think making up the timeline within a decade, I wouldn't be surprised if we can do single cell and fresh patient tissue more broadly around the world. But if you're trying to get a drug across the transom in the next, let's say two or three years, you're probably better suited picking a, a, a known diagnostic platform and feeding right. it your, your special sauce, you know, your, your signature that you've developed through your secret sauce. Which brings us Hold to on. the thing I, I'm most excited to talk about. So I, again, I, I've known Liang for a while and I, I knew about their data, their data science program, but a lot of folks probably don't because, you know, what we see is that you've got the single cell biological assay and you've got these drugs, but tell us about the data science. You know, you can't do single cell unless you're ready to, to do some serious compute. Exactly. I'm actually very excited about this um, division we started actually only in 2019. It's called data intelligence. The reason we come up with this name is, you know, we felt connecting data is one thing, but how to think about this more creatively, more effectively to get translate the data into knowledge that we needed. It requires a lot of intelligence effort, um, including machine learning. Um, the team has been you know, growing, and one of the first things, of course, is connecting data. So we are generating in-house data, single cell data, as well as we're connecting um, public available ones. So, so right now, we have you know, more than 19,000 patient data 
and some of them are single cell, some of them are bulk, and we now having more than 1.2 million transcriptome data. But of course, you know, as we are speaking, those numbers are increasing. So with that data, what we have been set out to do, one is generating biomarker hypothesis as the story I just told you about on standard around PD-1 predictive biomarker based on those single cell data analysis. But we also thinking about identify novel targets from those data sets. Um, so, so, so we're putting some efforts in around that. And uh, right now, with those data, we're generating in-house for Oxford and TNFR to clinical indication selection, biomarker hypothesis generating. We actively, the team have been actively crunching the data where we um, getting the patient tilt. We are doing tilt analysis with um, PCR clonotype gene panel as well, well as entire transcriptome. So, so we have been you know, generating those data every day. And uh, we have tried to get the results uh, analyzed as quick as we can. So, so the team basically, you know, um, working full steam ahead while we are getting the data, they analyze it right away. So seamless connection there, yeah. How big is the data science team, you know, maybe relative to the rest of the, the rest of the group? We are just growing right now. We have about six or seven um, scientists having, you know, computational, you know, and uh, also some biology background. And I think that's one of the things we facing the challenging is we actually try to figure out what the team's, you know, special experts okay. needs to be because you can people have very good computational science don't have biological knowledge, or you have people mm -hmm. have biology, not have good computational. It's really challenging to find the mm -hmm. right talent. And we've been trying to recruiting people and training them. And mm -hmm. so far, you know, I think it's making good progress, but continuously, I don't know, I would love to hear your experience and uh, talents like that in high demands. <laughs> no, it's, and, it's, a, it's a real challenge. You know, we have, a number of phenotypes in our company, right? So we've got people from backgrounds that are pure, purely computational, some who are biologists who've learned enough bioinformatics to, you know, be dangerous to themselves and others. <laughs> um, and then myself, I'm a biologist. I have almost no data science training except to become, you know, literate and conversant in it. But I think the most important people we found are the ones who are sufficiently well versed on both sides that they can have, they can be the communication bridge, right? So right. it's fine to have a team of deep computationalists, you know, we're very quantitative, mathematical, and ideally good programmers too, which is writing good software is very different than analyzing biological data. Exactly. Having that skill set is essential. And having people who can think about the biological problem is important. The communicative glue is is the maybe the hardest to find, but the most essential of all. Exactly. I totally agree. So as I said, we just at the beginning and uh, mm -hmm. this year we do have plans to expand the effort center around that as we are getting more and more patient data coming in. And so I think a year from now, on, if we have another conversation, hopefully, you know, I could tell you <laughs> mm -hmm. that much more, you know, um, enhanced activities center around, you know, getting those um, data, get them analyzed, as well as generating some novel approaches, novel algorithms. And we are also very open to collaborate with others. Well, that's the other thing, you know, the platform you've described, both in terms of the assay and the, the data science, you know, I could imagine this being a, an absolute magnet or a lightning rod for potential collaborations. But you know, how do you think from just corporate strategy about playing a little bit of defense and saying, all right, well, we've got our own pipeline. We need to do our own drug discovery versus opening up our platform to more industry collaboration. Um, we have been actually trying to balance both. And uh, one of the um, things also part of our company strategy that I personally believe is the way you do the best science is through open innovation. So you mm -hmm. need to work with others who have the expertise where we don't have it in-house mm -hmm. or, you know, share the platform to make a difference. Um, because if 
our approaches work. We want to change the industry paradigm. You need people buying into that concept. So we've been establishing some of the public announcement and you've heard is, you know, we had collaboration with Takeda, Kite, you know, mm -hmm. and others. And especially the Kite collaboration, uh, which was announced very recently, is through, you know, identify novel targets looking at AML patient example mm -hmm. using our single cell droplet-based uh, technology. So there is not only mining the data, it's about starting from the patient material to start with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then doing the work using a single cell platform and generating the data, then analyzing it. And then also we're building an arm of validation. So then after we identify those novel targets, we will go back to the patients to validate that. Right. So it's one of those collaborations where we see the synergy, you know, from Kite's expertise on the disease um, and their, you know, efforts together with our expertise of single cells and the access to the patient samples. It's a win-win situation and mm -hmm. we we are open to more and more collaborations like that. And another level of collaboration is, you know, why we're pushing our internal pipeline moving forward because of the powerful engine we have built. We're pumping out quite a bit innovative assets. And uh, mm -hmm. as a small biotech, we cannot possibly moving everything into the clinical trial. So right. we are actively in conversations with some industry top players them to see whether we can work with them to let them chaperone some of our assets to the clinical trial. Wow, so it sounds like an, just an amazing engine for discovery. I've, I've taken a lot of your time today. I just want to finish on, on maybe a slightly more um, human and less drug related note. I'd like to hear more about your team. You've mentioned a few times now that it's multinational and that you're in China and, and Boston and Paris. Was this intentional? Like, why did you decide to set a team up like this? What have been some of the benefits, but also challenges of, of leading a team other than, I can only imagine what your calendar looks like with all the time zone that you have to do. We have a saying, say high five bio, the sound never sets. So anytime, <laughs> <laughs> at any time of a given time of the day, this uh, team is working. So initially it was set up due to historical reasons. We have five scientific co-founders, three are professors at Boston area, two are at Paris. So therefore those two sites. Mm -hmm. And we also, you know, were fortunate to attract some Asian investors. So, so that's where we have the China presence there. And uh, through the company's progression, I see more and more the advantage of having a multinational presence. Just thinking about each site has its own unique strengths and they open a window to opportunities. And um, for example, you know, thinking about last year, COVID-19 affecting global in a different paces. So mm -hmm. while the China team was down because of the initial and the US and French team did full steam ahead and if their work in China be on a critical path, they can you know, take over those work. And when US or French side was suffering because of the COVID-19, mm -hmm. the restriction of working in the office, China team was, everybody was back to work for mm -hmm. steam ahead. So, so we, we really could help each other internally and externally. We set up collaborations in US um, with top academic institution with pharma and biotech. In French side, we also have a new set of collaboration as well as in China, we have its own unique um, external uh, innovation efforts. So, so I think as a company, if this company only is a US company, we will not be able to reach out to partners in France or China like that. As a final personal um, fun fact, Last year, during all the COVID-19, I was fortunate enough to be selected because I'm at the U.S. site by a U.S. institution as extraordinary woman advanced healthcare in the U.S. community. Then, you know, by U.K. financial um, reporting, I'm elected as the top female co-founder for Hi-Fi Bio at the French site. 
Then in China, <laughs> I was elected as one of the top 10 female co-founders in Hangzhou's China side. So, so it's like people view me as no pony, no matter <laughs> where I'm You got I'm an, an Oscar, a Grammy, and an Emmy this year. So <laughs> I, I actually contribute to the fact our no-call site engaged with no-call you know, activity so well yeah. gets recognition, and I'm the one who who got you know the the opportunity to speak for the company. And mm -hmm. at that time, in US, we're US company. In French, we're a French company. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the challenge, um, back to your question, also, a lot of us are working extra hours, especially mm -hmm. you know people at the leadership position, even in calls, early morning calls is a norm. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, it has to be for people that have a passion for the work you do. Otherwise, it cannot be sustainable. So it's not for everybody, <laughs> for sure. sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. La last question. <clears throat> Parting thoughts. What what should we look for from Hi5Bio in, in 2021? So next year, JP Morgan, what's the headline banner going to be for Hi5Bio? Oh, we're so excited to bring drug intelligence science, that concept we actually haven't got too much time to dive into, which is, um, you know, apply single cell science together with data intelligence, applying to all different aspects of drug discovery and, and development. So hopefully next year we start saying we applied drug intelligence science in the clinical setting and we're getting promising results. In the meantime, you know, we also this year we are hoping to demonstrate because of our power of discovery and development engine, we identify partners to help us bring in more assets into the clinical trials. So not only we're pushing two assets for steam ahead, three right now, consider COVID-19, which I know yeah. down the road we'll partner it up, but we will have multiples to come. So so look for Amazing. the news today. Yeah. Liang, thank you so much for your time today. This is fascinating. I, I look forward to seeing uh, your name and your company's logo splash across uh, LinkedIn and, and Endpoints News every morning when I, I tune in. I'm looking for your logo. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure talking to you. This has been episode 23 of Talking Precision Medicine. Please share it with your colleagues, leave a comment or a review, and stay tuned for the next one. Thanks for joining the conversation.